Um, so, without further ado, we're already running late. Um, over to Bruce. Thank you very much. Well, I'll start by saying, well, it's a story that's kind of best part of a million years in the making, so slightly five minutes late is not too bad. Um, but uh, obviously, we're opening up with the kind of question you might see on an episode of Ancient Aliens, and one of those, those big, bold questions, did ancient aliens upgrade the human brain? Now, I think it's fair to say that 99% of people probably out there would say no, without, without giving it much more thought than that. But we're going to go a bit more into it today. Uh, but we're going to start off with some other information on the stories that kind of make up our world, especially the stories around aliens and how they're changing and why I think they're changing. But we will get to that, the brain getting changed by aliens as well. Right, let me get to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the theme at the beginning is how new stories change the world. And obviously our stories are going to be involving aliens and their crafts. To start off with a story that you might be familiar with. 1976, the year before I was born, and the Viking mission is landed on Mars. And in the coming months, they would do a series of tests. Now, initially, the Viking landers were sent to Mars to examine the geology and the atmosphere. But as an aside, after a bit of pressure from a couple of scientists, they decided to also look for life. Now, you might have thought that it'd be nice to put that as a primary goal, but for some reason at NASA, they're not very keen on finding life on Mars. Well, they haven't been in the past. So, they included these experiments under this bit of pressure, and they carried them out at the two landing sites for the two different Viking missions that they had there. Now, the interesting thing is there's four tests that had to be done. And so, after extracting the Martian soil, they... They began, this, um, they began the experiments, I and mean, you can sort of see a bit of a, an image of a replica of the Viking lander there with Carl Sagan, who, uh, I guess, like I say, some, some people love him, some people hate him, particularly in the UFO community. There's a lot of mixed feelings about Carl Sagan, you know, because at one point he did actually write a paper on an ancient aliens kind of theme, the idea that we may have been visited in the past. But obviously in his later years, he was a, a massive skeptic of the idea that anything could have reached Earth and that UFOs had any relevance to that topic. Now, with the initial experiments that were done, they had some surprises because experiment one comes up positive, second experiment comes up positive, third experiment comes up positive, and then the fourth experiment comes up negative. Now, the interesting thing about this is there is a scientist who's looked through the kind of the archives of that mission. And so he had a look at what's going on kind of in the control center you know, at NASA, what's happening as this is going on? And he said, you might expect that as these experiments are coming in positive, that there would be some kind of excitement, right? You'd expect some excitement. But he said, no, in those notes, instead, there is a sense of fear. You think about that, there's a sense of fear. What's going on here? And then as that last experiment clicks in, he says, you could tell there's a sense of relief from that team. Now. That's absolutely bonkers. The idea that they, are, you know, our leading scientists, you know, they've sent out this mission to Mars, it's coming up with indications of life, and they are scared, and they are finally relieved when it comes up with one of them has failed. So we have, we have something strange happening here, because of course this is counter to everyone in the general public and the way that they would have thought about this. You know, the, the potential that we'd found life, so exciting, you know, here we go broadening our understanding of the cosmos, but not according to the NASA team. Now, one of the interesting things about that is also that we know today that that fourth experiment, which is this GCNS test, that it was actually flawed. And in fact, that it should have come up positive. We know that because it was looking for organic molecules. And everyone basically assumed there would be organic molecules because even if they're just coming from asteroids, they're hitting the planet. We know asteroids are full of organic molecules, so it should have been there. So what really happened is it had an error in the test. And we know that today because they've since confirmed organic molecules on Mars. Right? So in other words, all four tests should have been positive. But that hasn't changed much. And the scientists that were involved in that, designing these experiments, they spent the rest of their careers saying, we found life on Mars. And do you know what happened to them? They were drummed out conferences, laughed at, jeered at, you know, just declared persona non gratis, no longer welcome in the scientific community. 
because they kept saying, both of them, to their dying days, said, we found life on Mars. Absolutely crazy. And, and I say, and very tragic, really, as well. So you can imagine it. You know, these were accepted, you know, respected members of the academic community until they did that. <coughs> so again, what is going on there? Very strange. In more recent images coming from Mars, we see some quite extraordinary things. And I don't know if you can quite make it out here, but this funny looking rock is covered in what appears to be fungi. And you can kind of see that they are they're growing out on stalks at all these strange, interesting angles on the edge of the rock. And it's absolutely covered in these little, little fungi heads. Now, a team of mycologists and geologists, you know, who've looked at the images, they felt that these do appear to be fungi. Now, there was, that was kind of disputed again by NASA. They say, no, uh, this, this can't be, you know, it's probably some kind of mineral that grows and shrinks, because in some of the images you can see that they've grown, and some of them they've disappeared. So, they're clearly doing something. Again, that's still not good enough. No, it can't be, can't be life. And things are getting stranger and stranger on Mars. I mean, I don't know if you caught this one, where fairly recently, they imaged this very strange object, so you know, very large object with these spurs at very kind of you know uh, equal uh, equal distances from each other, going along the ridge. Now, some of the Mars scientists have said it's the most stunning image they've seen, the most surprising thing they've seen on the planet. You know, it doesn't really make sense. And of course, we've seen here you know, some speculation that you know, possibly alien spaceship could have crash landed on Mars. So. Who knows? But what we can say is, it's a very, very strange anomaly. And we'd, I think most of us would love to see that being examined close up to see what the hell is that? Now, it's not just about Mars where we find some of these issues around the academic view on life and life out in the cosmos. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with a British scientist, Milton Wainwright, and he's a, a collaborator of Professor Wickram Singer, who's, I, I would say, is probably the most esteemed scientist in the realm of panspermia, so the transfer of life across the cosmos, and the idea that life has been arriving to Earth for millions of years, you know, mainly bacteria and viruses raining down from space. So uh, Wickram Singer has been going on about that for years and years and years, without a huge amount of success in terms of changing the academic view on it, but he's, pro he's given a lot of good information, great evidence that this is happening. Now, Wainwright got on board many years ago when he heard about this kind of this, you know, that there was someone actually doing that, and he thought, well, that's exciting, you know, I'll get involved. And he thought, well, I'm probably going to have to queue up for this because, you know, everyone must be knocking on the guy's door, asking to join his team. So what he found instead, of course, was that nobody wanted to do it. They were all scared of it. And he realized that it was considered almost a death knoll for your career if you got involved with the search for alien life arriving to Earth. And he was obviously shocked. You know, he thought that this is just science, isn't it, surely? So he decided to do it. You know, he understood that there was a risk you wouldn't get funding, that you would maybe damage your career. Again, you know, this sounds totally bonkers to me, but that's how it was. And he's been involved in this now for many years. And you can see here, this is a snapshot of some microorganisms that he has recovered from the upper atmosphere. Pretty strange looking things. You know, obviously there's a, a wide range that he's now been recovering. And he said, you know, he does, you know, the analysis on them, finds these are organic, you know, they appear to be microorganisms from somewhere, and they are found at heights which preclude them from lifting up, you know, with the into the atmosphere from below. So they have to be coming in from above. And again, we actually have found uh, evidence of microorganisms on the outside of the space station and also on craft that go up and down. So they kind of know that microorganisms are up there and they are too high up to be explained easily by some sort of transfer from Earth. Now, one of the most interesting ones I've seen from Wainwright is this little orb, this little sphere. And this one, when it, when it hit his detector, it left a little crater. So he knows it was coming in at the kind of speeds you'd see for, you know, interstellar objects, for asteroids. But it's, it's, it's very small. So it left this tiny dent in their collector. And when it was brought back down and analysed, they found that it was, a, it was a, a sphere made of an alloy of titanium. And that inside was an organic goo, which was leaking out. You can kind of see it at the front here. This is the goo coming out of this 
this sphere. And so he theorizes it could be one of two things. Either it's a very strange organism that, you know, it's a spherical, happens to be like that, and it somehow has produced this shell naturally through, you know, some kind of chemical processes in it, or it's an alloy designed to survive through transfer through space. In other words, an artificial seed, a panspermia seed, sent out by some civilization that wanted to spread life across the cosmos. So a hardened titanium shell, and just fire these things out by the, you know, by the trillions perhaps, and that they got lucky, and that they collected one from the upper atmosphere. I think that's absolutely amazing. He then contacted NASA, and he contacted other organizations, and said, please, you know, replicate this. Let's look, let's see if there's more of these. He said, you got no reply. And down the bottom here is another one of the interesting uh, ones that he's collected, one of my favorites. Actually, if I skip that, I'd cut straight from there then. Right, so basically there's a salt crystal and that little face, he believes, is an organism that is trapped in the salt crystal. So you can sort of see it's got some sort of antennas and it looks like a little lower jaw and that that is protruding out of this crystal. And again, so this has come in from our space. So potentially that's the face of an alien organism. So you'd follow that, again, you'd think this would excite the scientific community, and you'd have all kinds of people queuing up to replicate this, you know, looking, oh, you know, all these animals just <laughs> raining down, you know. But he did not get any particular interest. It has been covered in the British media in the past, but in terms of the academic community, he's not had so much luck. And very briefly as well, just going across to... Um, fossil evidence as well of life out there. This is the Orgel meteorite and so that came down I think it's 1864 and uh, that's been analysed multiple times now including by uh, there's an, a NASA, another ex-NASA guy who has sort of been pushing this one for many years now saying that look there are very clear structures of organisms in here and you can see, you can see these are four different organisms that they found in there. You see a side view of one there. So it's a cell. And they said that, you know, we can see that there are, there's fossil organisms trapped in here, which they argue has come from, they think, a water planet somewhere else that's been hit by an asteroid. This stuff has been smashed off, carrying some of these, what would have been marine bacteria type organisms, off into space and have eventually arrived here. So, he got a lot of pushback when he put that out, and then so he's teamed up with a group of Russian scientists, and they've come back and put another uh, paper out on that, which was been met with kind of deafening silence, quite frankly, uh, despite the fact that again they are the whole team has said, look, we're absolutely certain this is life. This is kind of a theme. You're getting a theme now for the way the academic community thinks about life out in the cosmos. Moving a little bit further out in our solar system. I don't know if you recognize this, but this, this is an image of the dwarf planet Ceres. And Ceres sits out in the inner asteroid belt. In fact, it's the largest body in that asteroid belt. And essentially is, you know, like a dwarf planet. I mean, I've speculated, and others have speculated, that Ceres may be the moon of a destroyed planet. Because we have this enormous asteroid belt, and there's been hypotheses over the years that that was once a planet. Probably impacted another planet and was destroyed. And that Ceres may be its moon. Now, a few years back, NASA's Dawn probe happened to, you know, it goes past series, takes a load of images, and it brings back this image. Now, you see there, it's something interesting. Ooh, there's that illuminated area in that massive crater. And actually, that's the largest crater on series. And so right in the middle, we've got this interesting glow of light. And so there's been a, a fit, well, the current kind of, hypothesis in terms of the most skeptical hypothesis is that these are some kind of cryovolcanoes they lift up kind of a, a slushy icy mix from the inner part of the planet and that then leave these kind of salty uh, crystalline residues which reflect light now there's another scientist who point out that there's no known mechanism for the energy that would power such cryovolcanoes in series um, but yet yeah, obviously that nice nicely tidies it up if you kind of accept that but there's some problems with that because it gets a little bit more interesting if we look closer and look at a bit more detail. There's a couple of things you can see here. First of all, well that's that's obviously series as it turns into its night. And that's that's that same area in night. So if it's just reflective light, why is that still lit up in the darkness? So that's that's pretty strange. And on top of that, when they zoomed in, 
into the central area, they got something else, another interesting feature, again, what well, I think a mind-bending feature, and that's this, this little triangle here with a square and a circle, and we'll see a close-up in a minute. There was a, there's a guy over in Spain that's been doing some research on this, and he used an AI, uh, like self-learning algorithm, to look through space images, looking for structures, looking for anything like uh, artificiality. Now, it picked up on this in series, and it says, well, okay, there's a geometric pattern that's been detected. Uh, it seems to be a circle, a square, and a triangle. And then, so he thought, well, we've got to run this against, uh, you know, try a test against this. So we chose some people, got a load of people that had no specialty in this area, let them look at the same images. What do they see? And the majority of them also saw geometry there. They saw either uh, two or three of the shapes that he detected with the AI. So he's put out a couple of papers since on that and has added to that with another one on a, a strange mound on series, which he indicates might be artificial as well. So there you go, that's a little bit of a zoomed in view, so you can kind of see where they, they're showing you that we've got this very strange feature, looking very unnatural, quite frankly. Interesting as well that that's kind of very similar to the alchemical symbol in you know mystical traditions is this circle inside a square inside a triangle. You know, could be coincidental, but it's kind of funny that we actually have that kind of that symbolism ourselves in the ancient mysteries world. Could it be that someone has left us a bit of a, a message on Ceres, or might it be that it was the moon of a developed planet once, and that this is just some trace of that? And here you can see the zoomed out view, you can see the, uh, the, the bright spots in the crater. Now I've, uh, I've uh, thought about this as well, that when you look at it, and I'm not saying it is this, but it looks almost like, like some kind of star map, and then with this one marked with this feature in the middle, as to whether or not that's marking as maybe where we came, where someone came from before they came to series, possibly. Who knows, but what I'd like to see is a follow-up mission. But again, NASA has not really seemed that keen. So the question here is, is the scientific process malfunctioning? I would say it is. I would say that, you know, we get all these indications that there are some really interesting stuff out there, and yet, the people that we would think would get super excited and would start planning follow-up missions here, there, and everywhere to find out what is going on, you know, is life out there, you know, whether it's bacterial, whether it's technological, whatever it is, that these people are kind of failing us. And as I suspect that somewhere in the upper echelons of NASA, that there is a kind of an unspoken directive that you don't find life and that if you find life you're at risk of your career being destroyed for some reason that we don't know because clearly if people are this scared of doing it it must be coming from higher up in these organizations where they feel a sense of fear they don't even want to do projects where they go and say we're going to look for signs of alien life this is i think starting to change but we can see there's definitely a historical problem And this plays partly what this problem is. This is a, it's a paradigm problem. Now, some of you may be familiar with Thomas Kuhn's work on the paradigm change cycle. Now, Kuhn was a philosopher of science and historian of science. Now, he, he understood that you cannot take human beings and the human thinking out of science. You know, that there's going to be biases, there's going to be issues with uh, people standing, the things that they put themselves out there as being involved with, that all of these are real issues, tangible issues that will impact how we look at the world. The cycle begins, you have pre-science, which is your final problem, something or science interesting in, in nature, you want to look closer at, and normal science is coming up with a framework to analyze that issue, analyze that problem, start being able to do experiments in science, and then over time you get to model drift, and that's where you'll start to accrue a few issues where you cannot resolve findings, but they're not, they're not too profound at that point, so you carry on as it is. Eventually, these accrue to a point where we reach what's called model crisis, where you can see actually something's drastically wrong here. We know, a lot of these anomalies are stacking up and we're failing to answer what they are. And then last you get to model revolution. And this is where you'll have a, a number of competing theories, competing models for how that field should progress. And so that would be quite chaotic at times because you'll have splinter groups from saying that you know our model will work better others saying their model and meanwhile the existing paradigm that's entrenched will fight back 
We say here, the proponents of competing paradigms are always, at least slightly, at cross-purposes. Neither side will grant all the non-empirical assumptions that the other needs in order to make its case. Like Proust and Berthelot arguing about the composition of chemical compounds, they are bound partly to talk through each other. Though each may hope to convert the other to his way of seeing his, his science and its problems, neither may hope to prove his case. The competition between paradigms is not the sort of battle that can be solved by proofs. So in other words, it's no longer about objective science. It goes to a point of vested interests and a competition, you know, funding. We have all these other issues. People have put their, their name out there and have done very well, and then they find that maybe that what they've said is not right, but they don't want to change. And we have all of these issues will stack up. So there's no longer a case of two people really debating, it's two people talking past each other, where they, they know that you're wrong, so why listen? And we see that in a lot of fields today. I mean, certainly UFOs and aliens have suffered from that a lot. And so a query from Dr. Stephen Benner, who's actually the biochemist who looked at the NASA files of, for the Viking mission. And so this is the guy that found the evidence that they were very scared. So the consensus strikes back. Research that opposes a consensus is higher risk and more difficult to fund. The consensus can fight back, especially if it's institutionalized. Individuals will go to their graves believing what they were taught in school to believe, but institutionalized consensus will send others to their graves to defend the institutional consensus. And so this is, again, these are the problems that we're dealing with, in particularly in the fields of alien technosignatures and the study of anomalous aerial phenomena and all those fields that kind of adjunct to them. And the last quote here as well from Max Planck. An important scientific innovation rarely makes its way by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. It rarely happens that Saul becomes Paul. What does happen is that its opponents gradually die out and that the growing generation is familiarized with the ideas from the beginning. Another instance of the fact that the future lies with the youth. So we can see that today there's, there are shifts in these topics and they're mainly coming from younger people and younger scientists who have grown up in the era of ancient aliens and UFO documentaries and, you know, and movies all about these topics. There's a, there's a different thinking has come into view. So I would suggest that there's a paradigm shift ahead, probably not far ahead as well. And we've got some really tantalizing evidence of that occurring in the media at the moment. And I think most of you will be familiar with some of this. So obviously, uh, not so long ago, we had the emergence of Arrow in the US. Now that's the, the US Department of Defense, their all-domain anomaly resolution office. So this is looking at anomalies both in space, in the air, and in the sea. So these are where many, many people over the years have claimed sightings of anomalous craft, you know, operating both in the oceans, in the air, and moving out into space. So Arrow's been brought out to do that. They are currently they've received a lot of new funding, they've got a lot of new people coming in, so they're turning into quite a, a major department now. They've uh, just had a very senior sort of member of the DOD come in and take over to make sure they can get everything they need. So they are rolling forward. Now, of course, there's mixed views around Arrow. Some people say that they are the new blue book and that they're just there to kind of put it all under the carpet again. And others say that, well, you know, let's see, let's see what happens. Maybe they're going to produce something. For the most part, the head of it, Kilpatrick, I mean, he, he talks a good game, comes across as a, a pretty sort of knowledgeable scientist, who knows what he's, you know, what he's been told to really do in the background, none of us know, comes across as though supposedly, you know, professional, so we'll see, but the mere fact that this exists is very telling, and of course, that's a response to pressure from some of the senators and others who have seen that there's a popularity to this topic, and also you can argue, and certainly is argued by many, that it's part of a extended disclosure kind of initiative that's happening in the background from you know, the deep state. But aside to that, we've got other indications of this paradigm shift. We've got the Galileo Project, which has opened, of course, you know, a couple years back over in Harvard, uh, headed up by Professor Avi Loeb, respected astronomer. Big team, you know, they, they are fighting off applicants. And that, that's one of the most exciting things about it. But you think, well, once upon a time, 
people would have been UFO UFO stuff. No, we don't want to destroy our careers. Now he's saying, you know, he's getting so many applicants, he doesn't know what to do with them. And like, here we go. You know, you see that that was the team as it was, you know, a few months back. I'm sure they've got more now. They have a very large advisory board, funding board, all sorts of other people that are aligned with them, and it's only going from strength to strength. Again, so the sea change is happening in academia as well. And one of the big ones was NASA starting to come into the uh, the UFOs object, which has been, you know, quite a, a big, well, I'd say a really massive change, the fact that now we have been doing that. I know there's, there's going to be mixed opinions again of NASA, the old never a straight answer, and on top of that, as we've already tackled, they've got some really weird issues in their history about this topic, uh, particularly about the search for aliens out there. Uh, UFOs, they've been just as, well, I'd say even more skeptical on, uh, but yet, here they are, you know, rolling out their panel now, saying that you know we're going to be looking at UAP and that we're going to be assisting the DOD with this problem and taking it suddenly very seriously. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to come out and say, okay, we've got aliens or craft, but the point is here, it's not so much about what they're going to bring out as the fact that they've even said they're doing this, that this is a major paradigm shift because most of Joe public will look and say, well, if NASA is getting involved, then there must be something to this. There must be a serious business. And since beginning that little project of theirs, they have now just released this week their first study report. So this is an initial kind of an interim report. Uh, of course, they, they keep on saying there's no signs of extraterrestrials in this. There's no signs of extraterrestrials in this. Um, they've said this repeatedly, but you know, apart from that, the mere fact that they're looking at this and that you know they've put a fielded a, a, a fairly reasonable sized team to initially work out what are they actually going to do. So that's where they're at at the moment. They haven't actually, they're not going out and doing science yet, but they've said, well, we've looked at what we're going to do and now we have some plans of how we might assist in looking at these UAP, these strange anomalies flying around in the sky. So I think that one is very telling for the direction of events that we are heading into. Perhaps more exciting for many is the, uh, the whistleblower stories. Intelligence officials say the U.S. has retrieved craft of non-human origin. And so, allegedly, we've got something like 40 whistleblowers that have, have come forward and have spoken behind closed doors, giving evidence that there are recovered craft, there's recovered bodies, that there is, you know, all of this uh, top-secret program which has been rumoured for years and years and years. Obviously, it's massively part of conspiracy <coughs> law that this exists. Uh, the evidence that exists is, you know, I would say um, not always convincing. Some of it, yes, some of it, no. But this is a kind of a core narrative in the world of ufology and, and ancient aliens. So it's interesting to see it now sort of bubbling up into the media a lot more and having, of course, a congressional hearing on the topic, which again, you know, has happened in the past, but it would be, you would have thought a couple of years back unthinkable. And yet here they are, they're doing their congressional hearing bringing out these whistleblowers, alleged whistleblowers. Now, I have some problems in that narrative, we can come to a little bit of that, just say that obviously, well, we have people who are considered within the military world respected uh, and credible, and at least some of the senators and Congress people find it credible. I mean, it's, it's the problem at the moment, of course, is there's not actually evidence has been brought out to support the whistleblower cases, but Again, the mere fact this is happening and that the media have taken it seriously mostly, there's some pushback on that, but the public has been really kind of excited by it. The idea that possibly maybe there is something to that story of recovered craft and bodies in a hangar somewhere. Just a little bit of an example of how things can change even without that super compelling objective evidence that we would all love to see. Now, so this going back to, I think it's 2021, so we've got a cross-section here from 2019 to 2021. So this is, do Americans believe in UFOs? So you can see here, so four in ten Americans now think some UFOs that people have spotted have been alien spacecraft visiting Earth from other planets or galaxies. This is up from a third saying so two years ago. Half, however, believe all such sightings can be explained by human activity or natural phenomena, with an additional 9% unsure. But the interesting thing here particularly is, if you look at it, you see back in 2019, so some have been spacecraft, 33%, so up to then uh, 2021, 41%. So in those two years, it's gone up that massive jump. There's like 8% more people believing there's alien spacecraft coming here. And not because there was more evidence. Now, this is just since the uh, the New York Times, because they broke their big story on the idea that you know, black was it black budgets and 
something I can't remember the full title, but they had some Tom DeLong's project, TTSA, that people may be familiar with. Uh, other people from the deep state coming out saying that there's, there are real things flying around. So the anecdotal accounts have changed the way people think without reading out a spaceship, without bringing out any bodies. We're seeing jumps in acceptance of the idea aliens are coming here. Because the way this is working, most of this paradigm shift, is not about objective evidence. And that's something that I think surprises people all the time when you tackle it. They say, well, no one's going to change their minds unless you can wheel out a craft. Well, they are changing their minds. They're changing their minds because the TV is changing their minds. Now they're seeing it's all serious. NASA's getting involved. Look, there's whistleblowers. You know, every, everything's um, heading the right way. You know, Harvard have got a whole team looking at UFOs. Of course they're real. And there must be some pilots in these UFOs. So aliens are coming here. And so we can see there's an incline in belief. Obviously, that's going back a couple of years. So it's, it's increased since then. And it will continue to increase unless, well, unless there's a huge effort by the media to slam the lid on it and by vested interest to do the same. We've also started our own uh, non-profit project, which aligns with the same kind of uh, values we've been talking about. So it's the Alien Techno Signatures Research Group, and so that's, um, well, we'll go into a bit more, but it's basically a project of myself, a small team of scientists are doing, we're looking at terrestrial techno signatures, so indications of alien technology operating on Earth. Uh, we've been very fortunate in that we have a support in the US, who we're in the process at the moment of trying to deal with the, uh, the issues around getting funding from the US to the UK without me going to jail. But um, if, that, if that all works out, that should, should get us moving along. Um, but yeah, we have a team, biologists, geologists, myself, working together. And we'll come to what we're doing very shortly. So a new story that changes the world. So a lot of this about stories. Again, anecdotal claims, stories, you know, stories of crafts and hangars, stories about life on Mars, stories, stories. So a lot of this stuff, although we don't have the, the full evidence on, these stories are already changing the world and stories make us who we are. In fact, you think, you know, we have origin stories that we came from a big bang that nobody's got really good evidence for and that abiogenesis, the idea that life emerged from a rock pool, nobody's got any good evidence for. So we, we have a massive basis on anecdotal stories and, and hypotheses in the core of science and in the core of our human story as it is. So it shouldn't surprise us that these stories can be foundational to the way people live and think that and without this tangible objective evidence. And all scientists as well do the same. Most of them are running on those same stories of a big bang that they cannot support and abiogenesis with no evidence. So the case that got me really involved in where my project comes from is what I call the Bostock and Barrow case. So the primary contactees or experiencers in this case are Jerry Bostock and Valerie Barrow. Right? Jerry Bostock was a respected elder uh, in Australia and Valerie Barrow was a medium, also in Australia. Uh, they came together over this course of this case and provide an awful lot of information that I've utilised to do my project. And we can get to that here. Now, a little bit of backstory. So, back in 1994, uh, Valerie was approached by someone who said, well, I've heard your house is called Ringer, which is an Aboriginal name for, like, the dream time. And I've heard through, you know, friends that you're an open-minded person, you know, obviously you work in holistic fields, mediumship and all of that. I've got this artifact, this Aboriginal artifact, and I need someone just to temporarily look after it, because I've got to go to hospital. The lady had severe kidney and liver disease from alcoholism, unfortunately. And so she asked, could you look after this? Because, you know, it's called a Chiringa, and your house is called Al Chiringa. And it just seems coincidental, and I feel like you're the person I should leave this artifact with. So this is a small handheld kind of, would look like a rocky kind of silica artifact. And so it arrives wrapped up in paper bark, and she put it in a box, put it in her back office. Initially didn't think much more about it, but you know, was so happy to do that for someone. And again, being kind of, you know, open-minded kind of person, I guess, you know, someone who would be open to receiving a strange Aboriginal artifact from essentially a friend of a friend. She just puts it away and said, okay, that's fine. Didn't think much more about it. But then within a few weeks, she had a really strange experience. She had a, a sort of a contact experience, a voice in the mind telling her that, that there was a being there called Al Turinga, who had a message for her, had information for her, and that she needed to sort of sit and listen and eventually would write a book about it. So she says here, you know, I had that, the sacred Al Turinga stone wrapped in paper bark lent to me for two years. The indigenous people say it came from the stars. Uh, it surrounded me with a bright white light when I sat with it. My consciousness was raised so that the stone seemed to speak to me. And over the course of time, she got a lot of information from this artifact, at least, 
that's what she carries. <laughs> And funny enough, there's a little bit of a little dovetail here which I found recently is that the start of it actually goes back a few years before that when she picked up a copy of Communion. And anyone sort of familiar with the ufology and, and alien contact world will find this interesting because there are so many cases where people say they picked up that book, they looked at the cover, and that they got some kind of experience from it or recognition from I've seen these beings or have some kind of shift in their lives. And that's what happened to her. So she got a copy of Communion after Schreiber came to Australia and said there was a posters were everywhere for this event. She was seeing this, this being. And that then after that, she also read Transformation. So between these two, she had a recognition and a memory that she'd had these contact experiences, these kind of abduction experiences, many years before in her life and felt that she was on some kind of mission connected to these experiences. Experiences. I was that quite, you know, quite telling that there seems to be something strange about Stryber's book cover and the way it, it impacts certain people. So, after she's had the start of these experiences, a lot of information coming to her, the story of apparently um, you know, these beings coming here, she has all that going on, but then within a few weeks, of, well, actually say a few months of that, Jerry Bostock is driving along, not far from where she lives, and with a friend of hers. And when they get near to a turn-off, this friend, Rachel, turns around and says, that's, that's where my friend Valerie lives. Her home is called Al Chiringa. So Uncle Jerry, recognising this as being an Aboriginal word, you know, he's a respected elder of the Bunjalong nation, which themselves have indigenous traditions you know, suggesting some star origin amongst some of the Bunjalong people. So which is quite, again, he's quite sure he's open-minded about this. He's heard stories of ancestry from the stars. Um, so he says, well, take me there. You know, it stands out to him. You've got this house, Al Chiringa. Well, you know, let's go and have a look. See who lives there then. So they turn down the road and they head to Valerie's house. Now, as Valerie has said to me, she'd, she'd never interacted with Aboriginal people. Despite being in Australia her whole life, she'd never had any interaction. And that's quite common amongst sort of white Australians, is that they really are not interacting with Indigenous people there. So, so you can imagine, so she has this artifact, turns up at her house, and now there's a knock-knock at the door and there's an Aboriginal elder there. Doesn't seem totally coincidental. So. Jerry arrives, they have a conversation, and in the midst of it, she gets a sense that he knows that she's got this thing. So she kind of blurts it out and says, yeah, I know, yeah, you know I've got this artifact, but I keep it in the back room, you know, I'm not touching it, I don't do anything with it, it's just in a box. And he says, it's men's business, which is true, it should not be interacted with or handled by a woman in terms of their law. It's supposed to be only be handled by a high elder, that would be the shamanic elders. So sh technically, it shouldn't be in a house, but hey, she's trying to get it back to the Aboriginal people. So then he says, well, she said, do you want to take it? And he's like, no way. She said, you can see the fear. He doesn't want to touch it. Now, Jerry tells her a bit of some stories. One of the ones he tells is about a dream he had had. He says, you know, many years ago when he was uh, in his teens, he says, in this dream, I was on board a huge spacecraft in orbit around a blue and green planet. Everything on the ship had a bright sheen in it, particularly the uniforms of the people. There was lots of hurried activity, colored lights were flashing and bells were ringing. Everyone was in a hurry, following certain procedures as if there was an emergency. I was seeing everything through the eyes of a crew member, perhaps a pilot or a navigator. I felt an urgency to get my family together before some imminent event occurred. The scene changed and I was on board a smaller craft escaping from the mothership. As I looked out the porthole, I became aware of two things, the planet that we were heading towards and the mothership we were leaving. The mothership was an immense saucer or mushroom-shaped silvery craft with hundreds of smaller ships leaving it, one of them containing my wife. They were all heading away in every direction, trying to escape as quickly as possible. Suddenly there was a blinding flash and the mothership blew up. The impact on me was so overwhelming that I woke from the dream. Now, as it happens, I've had a, years ago, some shamanic journey, and I had a spirit, so I don't know if it's definitely related to this, but it certainly has uncanny echoes. And during this experience, I found myself you know, looking through the eyes of a being, in a blue uniform, very tall humanoid being, piloting a craft, and having the awareness that behind me in space, there'd been destruction of a lot of allies. I just knew that a lot of them had been killed, and that there was a pursuit to this craft, and that we were heading towards a planet and then it switched to something else. And I never put too much mind to it because, to be honest, the other things I experienced were more profound. They were about nature of reality and God and all sorts of... So I didn't think too much about it. I had no context for that back in 2001. Now, 
it would set me off, I suppose, later on because it, I noticed things in Valerie's story that made me think of that. I think, oh, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I should look into it. And I wrote a little bit about that in my book, Ancient Aliens in Australia, which is no longer in print because um, there's some stuff now I just don't agree with anymore, so I took it out of print. But um, whilst writing that book with Stephen and Evan Strong, and some of you may know them, they're Australian father and son research team. I think they've appeared on Ancient Aliens as well. Uh, they actually made me aware of Valerie Barrow, and that's how I connected with her. So some of a mutual friend had connected myself to the Strongs, having been aware that some of my research overlaps with their research, and so we ended up collaborating on this book. And towards the end, they said, oh, by the way, we've got this friend Valerie Barrow. She's got a book. And in it, she talks about beings that seem to be associated with these stories that we're writing about, this arrival to Australia of some aliens, and you know, you're going to probably find it interesting. So I read the book, realized that actually there was a lot of information in there that potentially I could investigate and see whether or not it was a load of rubbish or there was something to it. And particularly with that experience I'd had, you know, it made it stand out. So I thought, well, that sounds familiar. That's a bit like that, that vision I had many years ago. So I took that on board. Now in the story, there is the arrival of a giant craft that uh, it, it comes to you about towards 800,000 years ago. There's this enormous craft, and then when it's here, there's a kind of a betrayal. There's been a negotiation, apparently, with a species that are here on Earth, that they are occupying the planet. There's a negotiation that they're gonna hand the planet over, and instead, once this craft is here, it's betrayed, it's blown up, technologies are harvested, genetic materials harvested, and there's basically, it doesn't go the way that these more peaceful uh, voyagers had hoped, and very few of them survived. Now Jerry says to Valerie, I want, I want you to go somewhere, I want to kind of have a, I feel like we should go down to, to Gosford, to this sacred site, the Gosford Glyphs. Now the glyphs themselves, again these are controversial, I mean they are argued by some to be ancient pre-Egyptian, uh, pre, pre kind of early archaic Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, some of them just are recognizably Egyptian hieroglyphs, other than not, some very strange, and some of them are very clearly modern engravings. Um, but that aside, I don't really, I can't say whether they're really ancient, but that site is an Aboriginal sacred site. So next to the glyphs, I'm saying most people, if you've heard of that site, would have heard of the glyphs, but surrounding it is an Aboriginal sacred site, both for men's business and women's business, divided into two parts. So Jerry feels that they should go down there. And so they do travel down together, and they also go with um, a friend of theirs, Helen, and Helen is also a medium. So we've got two mediums and an elder. Whilst they're there, it was initially kind of a, a channeling kind of experience, which um, Valerie says he gets information, saying about beings that came here in the past, and all sorts of stuff like that. Nothing particularly, I don't think, particularly um, relevant here, other than that it's just the general stuff about contact experience in the past. But then after that, they have a very strange experience. They have a kind of a time slip. So one minute they're there and it all seems quite normal, and then they look around, they realize that the forest is now seems to look more like dense jungle, and there's a heavier, hotter feeling in the air, very humid. And when they look down across towards the waters of Broken Bay, which is just off, well, just the edges of the, the town of Gosford, they, they notice that there seems to be a craft crashed in the water, and above it is another one. There's these two saucer crafts. And so they're, hang on, you know, what is going on? And they look at each other and realize that they also don't look normal humans anymore, that they themselves seem to be, in some way, non-human. And along the beach, they can see other non-humans dealing with pulling people out of the water. And the other craft is talking is pulling beings out of the water. They have this sort of profound time slip experience. So these time slips are reported in the paranormal law. We know that there's a famous case of two English um, teachers who walk through the Garden of Versailles, who walk through a mist, and then they start seeing all these people in what they think is fancy dress of period clothes for, um, I believe it's, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the Queen, but one of the, uh, so they see all these people dressed up in these period clothes, and then later on they walk back through the mist and they realize that apparently there's never been any, there was no, not supposed to be anyone there. So they'd had a kind of time slip. So these are sometimes reported, and I think there's other cases with a, a plane that flew over uh, an RAF base where it's all planes that didn't exist at that time, and later on the pilot would see those planes. So he somehow slipped and saw the future. So there are reports of these kinds of events. Now, again, this is an anecdote. So take it as you will. But so they report having this very really strange experience and then with it a knowing about this event, this arrival of this craft, its destruction, and then more about Jerry's experience where he comes to realize that, that this is the connection to the dream he had had when he was in his teens, that this is the event, that the craft is the same. And it's, he was the pilot of the saucer that's in the water. And he gets the recollection that he drowned in that craft, skewered to the, um, the controls. 
So he sees that as you know, a very profound experience, they claim. Now, so after this, so you've got, in the information they got, allegedly, they are told that these survivors, and there's not many of them, I think less than 100 survivors from a ship that had thousands of beings on it, that they can no longer colonize Earth. They realize they can't do this because their method of colonization is using genetic engineering technologies to modify themselves to suit planetary environments. Which makes sense, because you can't just land on random planets and live there. So they utilize these advanced technologies to change themselves en route, but they're not ready to live here. That their craft has been destroyed before that genetic engineering has completed. So the beings that are on the beach, they are struggling. A lot of them can't breathe properly. Some of them being being burned by the sun's radiation. You also find that when they try and drink the water, that they're getting bacterial infections. They're having all the real world problems you would expect to have, really, if you were not completely suitable to live in an environment. So when they find out, they say, well, we can't colonize the planet. The handover has failed. We're not going to be able to really survive long enough to make any meaningful uh, change to this planet, unless we go to a kind of a plan B. So plan A is out the window, no colonization. Plan B that they come to is a genetic intervention. So they realize that, these, that what they can do is that they can genetically engineer what they call the upstanding ape-like creatures using a mixture of genes uh, from their people and from these others and create embryos. And so they, are, they then go out and basically sort of, you know, capture some of these early hominins, take them back, and then they begin to work on them. Now, it's pointed out in this information as well that they say that really we're trying to engineer a new species from what is essentially our medical kits on these ships. So it's quite crazy. They know it's a crazy project. It's not going to go easy. The first was babies were born with larger skull and less hair, which went on then to evolve. So the more children born, the less hair was manifested. So it became more like us. You know, bigger heads, less hair, different, a different look to the other hominins. So that's the claim. Also in this information that is given to them, is the account of uh, another event five years later. That there was a follow-up mission from what is more like a, a policing or military wing of this alliance, and they arrive, and they, under no sense terms, tell this other group, you've got to leave the planet. That was the agreement. Now you get off the planet, or we begin bombardment. Most of them leave. And what they say is they leave, and they jet off towards Orion. Apparently that's where they're from. But not all of them. And so they are in deep, hardened underground bases. So what they do to hit these bases is they drag in asteroids and pummel the planet. So it makes our nukes look like pea shooters, is the way they describe it. Said so if we want to, we can split a planet right open. So they begin this bombardment, you know, multiple locations around the world, and these people are described as being lion-looking humanoids, like that. So that's a, a 40,000-year-old engraving of a lion man that's found in Germany. Now they describe as looking somewhat like that, funnily enough. Very strange, I'll be first to say it. Right, now, there's another event that happens around the same time as this is all going on, which some of you may be aware of, you follow ufology. Uh, there is the Gosford mass UFO sighting. So this is four months before the trip to Gosford, and there is this profound kind of event where you know, dozens of people uh, on Christmas morning, 1994, see a strange craft hovering over the waters, in fact, zipping around above the water off of Broken Bay, um, covered in lights, this craft apparently, some sort of a sphere, some as a kind of cylinder, so I think depending on what way around it was, how it, how the, which makes some sense, so the view of it was different. Uh, police, you know, saw it, there was a, you know, an aircraft control guy saw it, all sorts of other people who see it as credible. The police said they took dozens and dozens of witness accounts, all the witness accounts they said were the same, so they said, you know, it was a consistent report of this craft that was seen. Now, one of, the, one of the things that stood out to me is that they said a, a, a large amount of water was sucked up. They watched this craft stop in one place where it sucks up a large volume of water, pauses for a while, and then it just drops it out. Now, it makes me wonder, were they, were they collecting something that was in the bay? Considering that this story is now about to break a few months later, have they retrieved something that was in that bay, i.e. the debris from the ancient craft? But possibly. Certainly the timing is interesting. So is this more than science fiction? That's the real question we're going to get to in the next part. I'll probably pause it there.
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for bearing with me. I know that we've tackled some quite strange stuff in there at the end, so let's see. So yeah, the big question we're coming back to, is this more than science fiction? Because obviously there's lots of stories out there, lots of people say they had encounters, or they've done channeling, or you know, they've seen an alien. We've got, we've got thousands and thousands of stories. Now, some of them are true, some of them aren't. Um, very hard to judge at times. So the way I looked at this work was, if I'm going to put my, myself, my, my name behind it, if I'm going to put myself out there talking about this, I wanted to be quite convinced that this was a real event. Um, didn't really need to do this. At the, at the time when I got involved with this, to be honest, I just had my, my previous book uh, come out, The Intra-Africa Theory, and got Graham Hancock uh, written the foreword. He was on board. He put it on his social media and everything. So I was looking to do a sequel to that, Into America. I had a toss-up. Do I do Into America, follow up all that? You know, I've got his support, I've got you know, a lot of interest. And like he said, you know, if you go in the aliens route, you're given a club to the other side to beat you with, Bruce. And that is true, because you know, we all know that that is the topic the skeptic is gonna come after you. Ancient mysteries, human origins, you have some problems, but not as much. It's very easy to dismiss people when they tackle the aliens topic or to attack them. So I had to weigh that up. So I had to be quite certain that this wasn't just a waste of my time. So we're going to go into why I decided it was worth the time. And we get that in this second half. So let's see, why do I say that this account is more than science fiction? All right, so we've introduced a little bit about the fact that, you know, I've set up a project around this. And again, you know, we have attracted some funding. The reason for that will come, hopefully come clear in the next part as to why someone thinks that there is something here that is worth funding an investigation of. I'm going to be very careful how I tackle this next part because it, it is quite technical. I don't want to really overwhelm people with it because, to be honest, one thing I know about when you give presentations, it's a presentation of any topic, it's very hard to go away remembering everything someone said. In fact, so usually we all of us, we go away with the gist of it. So I don't want to sort of hammer you with it because you can always look at some of the information, you know, online afterwards or contact me if you have questions. So I'm going to try my best not to sort of pummel you with this because it does get technical. And uh, I'm a bit of a geek about this stuff, so I, I went too far into it. And I read dozens and dozens of papers on these topics. So this is the enduring mystery of Australasian tectites. Now, one of the first questions I had to ask myself was, if there was a giant craft, and I'm told this is giant silica living AI craft, this is the way it's described, right, absolutely massive, has been destroyed in orbit around Earth and melted, raining down molten debris. So that, that's, that was the information I was working from. Now, also, a couple of dates were given. One was that it was towards 900,000, and another part, some, apparently, due to the way that they perceive time, they could have been closer to 700,000. Well, okay, let's look in that range, 700 to 900,000. Is there anything that stands out that could be anything to do with a giant silica craft being destroyed and raining down debris across the planet? Which I think is a big ask. Didn't expect to find anything, especially when you're talking about dates going back that far. And then I found out about this, the enduring mystery of Australasian tectites. And you see a little picture there of a, a tectite uh, button and another tectite sphere. And we'll get to some bigger pictures. So tectites are a type of glass. They are a geological anomaly. Uh, they are, I think, interesting. Other people may find them dull. Um, but they are unlike other glasses. And I'll come to that's why that is. They're primarily made of silica around about 75 to 80% silica. I mean, I'll tell you very briefly that they also have a high proportion of aluminium, around about sort of 10, 11% of aluminium, and then a range of other metals and compounds. Well, this is the distribution field for the Australasian tectites. Absolutely massive. Stretching all the way, of course, you can see from China, from the north, down to the tip of Antarctica in the south, and then you know, way out to Madagascar and out into the ocean on the other side vast, covers about 30% of the planet's surface. And I thought I, was a, I had a good head for ancient mysteries, but I'd never heard of it until I went looking for this silica debris from a giant craft and found out that there's this persisting scientific mystery around this glass. And you can see the preponderance of it is limited to parts of uh, Indochina and Australia, particularly clustering around the southern half of Australia. And that part is where you get what's called the tectite buttons, and we'll get to those. But they are limited fairly to southern Australia and to parts of Java. And the rest of it, we have a range of different types of or different forms of the glass. We'll see some images of that briefly. But just keep in mind the size of that. 
absolutely enormous. Now the argument is, supposedly, it is thrown to those locations in an impact event. Right. So that's, a, you see a bit of a close-up there on a, what's called a tectite button. So these were glass spheres that entered the atmosphere and the front edge melted, runs back, and you can see the other half of the sphere in the back there. So this, is, this occurs as the sphere enters the upper atmosphere at a gentle angle, bouncing along the edge of the atmosphere, it starts to melt and then you get this form and then they fell, and they fell along southern Australia. For quite a while there was a uh, NASA theory the lunar, you can see the, on the lunar origin of tectites. For a long time the NASA guys, they thought that these came from the moon. Right? So we had, we had rocket engineers, we had all these guys from NASA, they did the experiments that the NASA aimed, trying to recreate these forms, and they come to the conclusion they have to have come in at these gentle angles from outer space. So where can they be coming from? Where can we have this glass that's raining in from space? Where might that have originated? So they came to the, the conclusion it was the moon. So what they actually felt was that probably an asteroid had impacted a volcano on the moon, and that you'd had volcanic glass had been thrown off into space, and then had headed towards the Earth, even a cluster or a large chunk, and then had rained down across the planet. That persisted for about 20 years. That theory was doing battle with the opposing group who believed that there had been an impact in Indochina and that this material had been thrown up, and some of it thrown up so powerfully it had gone into space and had come back down. So this was the two main camps. In years past, during the last 130 years, there's been a lot of other theories. Ancient glass making by a lost civilization, antimatter event, comets scraping on the edge of the atmosphere, all sorts of theories were thrown at this before eventually it was settled on one of these two. Now, what happened to the NASA guys is that we recovered lunar material. And at that point, it became obvious that it, it did not match. You could not really get this tectite glass from the lunar surface. And on top of that, they realized that the volcanoes on the moon had been, um, dawn well, had been basically um, dead for far too long, couldn't, couldn't um, originate this material, which some of it is basically dated to 788,000 years ago. Lunar volcanism had ended long before that. So it couldn't be lunar glass. There's another, again, I don't see technical, but there's, there's a number of other problems with this theory. One is if a large swarm of glassy material was coming from the moon, it'd be destabilized by the sun and it would have broken up and you would have had lunar glass raining down all over the planet, not just in this 30% of the planet, but all over it and, and going everywhere out into space, it'd be all over the place. So they realized that actually this didn't add up. So at that point, and the way I look at this, it's a bit like in a, a boxing match where, you know, if one guy gets knocked out, the other guy's the winner. It doesn't mean that technically they're the best, but the other one's down, that's it, it's the end of the match. So that's what happens to their theory, is that they, they were knocked out. So even though they actually had a lot of elements that were superior to the impact hypothesis, so that's hence is why they'd gone on for a long time arguing. There was no clear winner from the, other, from the general evidence that they were tackling. But as the NASA guys kind of folded, they said, well, look, you still have to explain some key elements. In particular, you have to tell us how does uh, an impact lead to what's called a homogenous fined glass. Now, to be clear, the glasses here, these are homogenous fined glass. And that is because when we heat them in a crucible, you boil off all of the stuff you don't want and all the bubbles of gas come out of it, you mix it very well and you end up with glass like this. You know, it's got no bubbles in it, it's hardy and all the rest of it. We know that that can also form naturally, it forms in volcanic calderas, right? We end up with obsidian glass, which also is a homogenous fined glass. These are extended events. When you heat glass in a, cold, you know, in a caldera, or if you heat it in a crucible, it's done over a period of time. So you can outgas all the materials, you can remove all of that, and you can mix it. Now, that's very different to an impact. An impact is an is a instantaneous transfer of energy. So it's very short-lived. It shouldn't be the time for mixing of all the materials and for this uh, homogeneity and for that final fining of the glass. So you know, you've got a problem. You have to explain that if you're gonna say an impact has caused this. As we say, it, it just doesn't work like that. It's breaking some of the laws of, of how, well, basically fluid dynamics and bubbles moving in liquids. So that was kind of left as an anomaly. And so they said, well, look, you know, still it has to be an impact because there's nothing else. Now, it's interesting, in one of the NASA papers, there is somebody who at least once said, well, you know, could it have been something else that came from deep space and come in? But, you know, how would that work? How would it end up being captured by the Earth? How could it explode in orbit? And, you know, so he did, there was at least one person who pondered, possibly there's more to this. But they didn't go any further than that. And I can sort of understand why the paradigm, going back to the 60s and 70s, nobody really would have fought beyond these kind of fairly simple natural solutions. 
Another example very quickly of a, of a glass that's relevant here is trinitite, which of course trinitite does form in a, a very short duration high energy event, nuclear bombs. And so we know what trinitite looks like. It's a foamy, bubbly, messy material with bits of partially melted rock included in it. Bits of organic material like soil included in it. It does not look like the glass you see on the table. And anyone who's seen a picture of trinitite will be familiar with it. So it looks nothing like that. And another type of glass that looks like trinitite is asteroid impact glass because it's formed in a very similar situation. Sudden energy event, get part melt, part mixing, all of the same, pro same issues you would have with the trinitite. So what is, what is behind the mechanism to end up with this perfectly fine glass? Something is not stacking up in the physics. So again, so these are the tectite buttons again. So you can see, as I say, these primarily land up here and down here. They are not all across the field. Most, most of that field has a different form. And again, that becomes relevant. You can see here, these are the different types of Australasian tectite. So you've got these spheres. Notice the size of that. If we're going to talk about it being knocked out into space, right? Think about the energy. These are not just small pieces. So you've got cannonball-sized pieces of glass included. You've got these tectite buttons, which are small. They are small. And then you've got a range and assortment of others, but the, the discs, dumbbells, and teardrops, and other spheres. So these, we know, all of those others here, that they did not enter from space. Or at least they didn't enter from space in that form. So whereas that would have come from a sphere, a smaller sphere, or that would have melted down to a smaller size and produced those. And then lastly, we have Muangnong layered tectite, which is unlike all the rest of them, and that is formed on the ground. The pools that have mixed and swirled and folded on each other, and they give us this distinct layered tectites. Those can be 25 kilo pieces. It's fully accepted those cannot have been thrown far, that they must be marking the crater site. They have to be what they call uh, proximal ejecta. So the stuff is right at the, the, the center. The rest of it is called distal ejector, the furthest thrown stuff. Right, so we have these different forms. Now, that becomes very interesting as well in a minute. So, because there's, there's some real issues with this. I wouldn't like to be whacked with that cannonball of it either. Right, so again, quick comparison for you, just to get a visual. Impact melt glass, Australia's and tectite button. Completely different. I mean, I don't think it needs um, be laboring the point. You can see, so tectite glass, hold it up, looks like, almost like a bottle, you know, glass. Impact melt glass, looks like a rock that's been heated for a while, yeah? And you can see it's got these large cavities, these are bubbles, and obviously inclusions of unmelted rock throughout it. That's a typical piece of, of impact melt glass. So when you look at the two, obviously scientists are not totally stupid, they can look and say, so weird about this, isn't it? Why does that one look like that? And why does all the other ones look like that? And they, we've got a, it's like a hundred or so impact sites with melt glass like that. And what we don't find in any of those craters is glass like that. Never. It's never been found in a crater. Right? And that's a bit funny. Why doesn't it happen in the other ones? Muangnong distal ejector. Okay, so how big is this crater that would cause something like this? Well, if it's really an impact event, Right, which is their argument. You've got these massive chunks of this Muangnong tectite, so we know it has to be near the crater site. Well, that map there, those little black dots, you can see them spread around once there, those are all Muangnong tectite sites. Well, look, you know, you've got them there, you've got them stretching all the way up into China. So these are massive chunks. So are we talking about a crater that big? Seems a bit absurd. That's the end of our planet, if we had a crater that big. That's an that's a absolute doomsday event. So we know that there can't have been a crater that big. So how can these chunks be everywhere? If these are supposed to be proximal ejector at the crater site that cannot have been moved that far, how can they be spread across the whole of like Southeast Asia in that way? It's like, hang on, that's a, you know, that's a bit of a head scratcher. So they've struggled a bit with that because it doesn't really make sense. There's a great guy, a geologist over in the US, and he's asked this question. Are you sure tectites are meteorite impact glass? It's on Meteorite Times magazine. Now, Owen, a bit of a debt of gratitude, really, because he, he really nails this, is that this material, he argues, has formed in an aerial burst events. 
So in other words, something large broke up in orbit or entering our atmosphere and some of the larger pieces of that something entered the atmosphere and exploded in massive nuclear bomb-like blasts. And so one of the kind of the absolute sort of proofs of this is this piece here because so the, what you have here is one piece of Muang tektite that cooled hard and then a splash of molten material has joined to it. He said the only way that could happen is a second aerial burst several hours later. Now that doesn't happen in an impact. You have one lot of melt. That's it. He says that is the signature of an aerial burst. So you've got multiple objects are coming in and they're exploding on a massive scale. So Muang Nong Tekta, he says, is the pooled material from these blasts. And these are like plasma uh, storms. So they're melting the ground, they're swirling the material. You've got molten glass from, you've got molten material from the object, molten material from the ground, swirling together and moving around in melt sheets. And when they solidify, you get this layering effect. So that doesn't sound like a, uh, an impact. And we know further to this that this is the case because, again, more recently, an ancient, we've got this new story came out, an ancient fireball turned miles of the world's driest desert to glass. And this is in At the Atacama Desert, so you might know from the Atacama humanoid and the scandal of that alien mummy. But that's, that's out in that same region. And so we have here again, so the, the twisted and swirled glass. Again, like the Muang Nong, we have this layering and swirling of the glass. Again, characteristic signature of an aerial burst. Something large came in, exploded, melts the surface, but doesn't impact the ground. Come back to that map, and you see, where does the trail end? Well, if that's ground zero for the event, whether on the ground or above the ground. I obviously argue above the ground, they argued on the ground. But that's ground zero. We know that because of the Muong Nong. We know that the major chunks are exploding there. We know that that's kind of where the, the bulk of the larger pieces are. Where is the end of the trail? Well, the end of the trail is right down there in Antarctica. And we know that as well because the hottest, smallest microtectite pieces of debris that travel the furthest are found in the ice there. So we know that this, whatever it was, is going that way. I would suggest that that was the orbital path of the ship that broke up here in orbit and that the debris chain carries on this way. With the, we have here, along here, the button tectites and here. As it explodes, we've got a lot to go down there. The main pieces of debris go straight down, angles, major explosions. The rest of the debris chain breaking up carries on along and then it begins to disperse and it rains across Australia. A few years back, a story wrote by The Guardian, again relevant to this, Antarctic Crater Reveals Asteroid Strike. Now there's some scientists were mapping crater sites in Antarctica and what they uncovered from magnetic anomaly data from satellites was that there had been a major impact of some sort. Indeed they think that this object was, I think they say it's about uh, three to seven miles across enormous, almost like a planet. Same sort of size as the object that killed off the dinosaurs, or the bulk of the dinosaurs, and at least that's the working hypothesis for them. See there's some controversy around that anyway. But, so an enormous object, three to seven miles across, broke up in the atmosphere, five large pieces hit the Earth, creating multiple craters over an area measuring 1,300 by 2,400 miles. So the effect would have been to melt all the ice in the path of the pieces, as well as the crust underneath. The biggest single strike caused a hole in the ice sheet roughly 200 miles by 200 miles, which would have melted about 1% of the ice sheets, raising the water levels worldwide by about two foot. The, the climatic conditions were different at that time of the strike, which is about 780,000 years ago. So that's the time this dating on the material is 788,000 years ago. So from when the asteroid is believed to have wiped out, sorry, time, so about yeah. The impact created dust storms, fires, blocked out the sun, cooked the Earth's atmosphere, uh, so it had all of that side of it. So the only reason why this didn't have the same kind of effect is because it was in an ice age, so the seas were mostly frozen, so the energy was absorbed. Otherwise you'd have enormous tsunamis, kilometers high, raging around the world. So most of the energy was impacted and absorbed by the ice and obviously the melt. But what was that? That's quite interesting because that is right down at the end of that debris chain. Hmm, some enormous pieces of something plummet into the ice. Now over to China, and we've got an interesting site there. 
the Bose archaeological site in China where they found tectites right next to human-made tools in the same layers. So this suggests to them that basically a group of early hominins that was ranging around likely saw the fires from some of these catastrophic explosions, these events, and that they were drawn to it. And then they found the loose rocks and stuff at the site and made hand tools and weapons from these. Well, I'll be honest, I couldn't help but think of a movie I'd seen. Because you think about it, so you have a group of hominins, they enter a rocky clearing and they find a strange smooth black glass on the ground. Right? So, I don't know if that was just pure cosmic coincidence, but that's certainly wild. Especially when we come to the link between this material and the change in human beings. Which, of course, is what the whole premise of 2001 A Space Odyssey is, is that they have this encounter with this black glass, and shortly after, they're changed, and they begin to make weapons. So, that, for me, was quite a profound and strange link. What else was happening at that time? Well, a lot. Remember we said earlier on that there was the claim that another group arrives and that they bombard the planet. Kind of a mission to push these others off of Earth. Well, I thought that can't be real. I would have heard about it. It would have been on some you know, Nat Geo special. We'd have all heard of it, surely. Well, that's not the case. And bear in mind that this information is from 1994. Valerie published a book on it in 2003. But in 2015, I think 2016, there was a discovery made that it turns out that around about 790,000 years ago, multiple cosmic impacts occurred around the planet. And so they found that these have occurred in, so their studies indicate that they occurred in Asia, Australia, Canada, and Central America, with virtually identical in age, although in some cases their chemistry differs markedly. Why is that important? Because this is not a single object breaking up which you'd think of, oh, it's maybe a debris swarm. No, these are different objects coming in from different sides, whacking our planet all at the same time. What's the chances of that? Very strange event, because we expect one large object to hit every sort of 100,000 years. Here, we're getting pummeled by them all at once. And you hark back, we're told they use these as weapons. They pummeled the planet. And this is going back long before this was discovered. So it couldn't have been cherry picked and put into the information by someone simply reading it online. And what else was going on back then? It was a wild time, I tell you. What happens when the magnetic fields flip? Well, we lose the protections from cosmic rays, and it turns out, when did that last happen? Oh, around 780 to 790,000 years ago. That was the last time we had a full magnetic reversal, so a catastrophic dec decrease in the fields of the Earth, followed by a flip. Now, during that period, you get all sorts of plasma phenomena in the skies, you get uh, heightened levels of radiation penetrating to biological you know, entities on the planet. A, really a wild time. Now you've got to think, imagine your people living back then. So you've got a, a, a billions of tons of black glass have rained down, you've got multiple impactors hitting the planet, firestorms, earthquakes, tsunamis, a lot, and the fields have shifted. You're getting cosmic rays, you're getting plasma storms in the sky. What a time to be alive. Slightly worse than the last few years we've had. And then, the, the probably the, one of the clinches here is, at that point as well, we see a sudden shift in the climatic cycles of the planet, which have been stable for millions and millions of years. Around about 800,000 years ago, there is a, a sudden change where we transition to this 41,000 year long cycle, sorry, from 41,000 to 100,000 year durations. Now, this gives us periods of warming for about 10,000 years at a time in that cycle. Now, it is theorized that if not for that destabilizing change, that we would have never become an advanced civilization because we need that 10,000 years to accrue technologies to get to where we're at. So before that, that wasn't possible. So as has been pointed out by some people who look at this, it's almost like, you know, well, a bit like a terraforming event. It now enables our species to have these periods where you can accrue enough knowledge and technology and rise up with enough numbers to kind of get somewhere. So isn't that funny? So that times again with the other events that we've just tackled. These are all happening at the same time. What a time to be alive. That's not all, though. Of course it's not all, is it? There's going to be more to it. Because remember we talked about us, human beings. What was going on for us back then? Well, 
Around about that time, as you can see here, just prior to that, we have the super archaic hominins. So these are basically Homo erectus and other like, Homo uh, types that lived in that period, very archaic. And some of them, well, put this way, if, you could recognize them. If you were in the zoo, you'd say, what's that guy doing in the cage? But if they sat next to you on the bus, you'd get off. So they're somewhere in the between, <laughs> right? They're not quite us, but they're definitely not quite apes. So we can see that. But then there is a transition occurs around about 800,000 years ago, and this is the splits occurring, where we have these new lineages of archaic humans are, are forming from the super archaics. And so that's happening right in that period there, where they've marked as 765 to 550,000 years ago. So in other words, we are seeing there the transition from the super archaics, some of them still survive, they live on for quite a while, but we transition from there, and then there's another split. And you can see the modern humans split away from the others, like the Neanderthal Sima hominins, Denisovans. There's many others who don't have names. They're only known from the genomics at the moment. So we call them ghost populations, because we know they're in our DNA, but we don't know what they look like. So although you would have heard of Neanderthals and Denisovans, they weren't the only large-brained hominins. There were others whose names are not yet you know, ascribed, but certainly there was at least about six different types of large-brained humans that coincided. But they all, they all emerge in that period here. So we go from a fairly stable kind of population type, mostly Homo erectus and variants of Homo erectus, to suddenly a weird thing happens here, which starts throwing out all of these large-brained humans, and that's a, you know, there's obviously later splits again between the groups. So that's happening again, right in that time that we've been talking about. Isn't that funny? Some news, some news that just came in the last week, which has been really important for my work, because look, if you, if you propose a hypothesis, as new evidence is found, it will either strengthen or weaken your work. You know, that's just the way that science works. If the new evidence doesn't square with what you're saying, you know, it's weakening your work, you're probably wrong. If new evidence comes and it fits well with your hypothesis, you're probably right. Now, this was a study that's just come out. Humans faced a close call with extinction nearly a million years ago, right? So I don't know if any of you caught this, but the, the data now suggests that there was about 100,000 people like living on Earth, I say, people, you know, archaic humans that were living on Earth going back about a million years ago. And then something really strange happens, that there is a, a, a population drop. And it goes from this around 100,000 interbreeding people, and they lose around 99% of the breeding population in what seems to be a very sudden event. And they end up at around 1,300 people. And so that's all of, you know, all of us come from those 1,300 approximate people. Those are our direct ancestors. And so when does that occur? Well, they found that this seems to be happening during a period around about 900,000 to 800,000 years ago. So that's kind of intriguing. So of course, the upper end of that is back into what we've been talking about. So we've got somewhere in there, there is this drop. But, it, but really, the first part of that, what's important, why it's happening in 900,000, and what is actually happening here, just I should clarify, the mainstream view at the moment is that this doesn't make sense. It just does not make sense. It must be wrong because there isn't a clear event that would just level 99% of the humans on Earth. So they're saying, is it climatic? Is there environmental change? What could do that? It's profound. And we don't see it clearly in the fossil record. It seems like there's still hominins wandering about. So how can we lose 99% of them like that? Doesn't seem, to add, doesn't seem to add up. So how does that happen, right? If it's not a climatic disaster, if it's not an asteroid impact, if it's not something like that, if you haven't killed off these people, why would you suddenly contract to just a thousand ancestors into breeding? Why aren't they mixing with these other people that seem to be still alive? And so that's the conundrum for the scientists at the moment. For me, that's not a conundrum, because this is a prediction of my work. I suggest that if these beings generally were here and they say they modified hominins in Australia, well, that's another problem for science as well because hominins aren't meant to be in Australia, but they should have been because around a million years ago, our archaic hominin ancestors, probably Homo erectus, they crossed into island Southeast Asia. We know that because of the finds on Flores, million year old Homo erectus remains and tools. So they have done what is considered the impossible. They crossed Wallace's line, and Wallace's line is the, what's a thought of, is the impenetrable barrier between Southeast Asia and Oceania. Shouldn't have been able to cross there. Mammals aren't supposed to have, the only rats got across on some bits of wood. That was the old hypothesis, right? But no, the, the tides and stuff there, the, the climate, you know, all these 
these things stopped mammals, and that's why we have a different ecosystem in Australia, because the mammals were prevented from entering. But if you can get to Flores, you're just off the coast of Australia. So there's been this conundrum. Well, if they've done all the work and they've used watercraft, have to have, they can't have swum. So if they've used watercraft and they've got to Flores, why aren't they sailing down to this giant continent just to the south? They can see it from the tops of the mountains on Flores. Why wouldn't they go there? Well, they would. It doesn't make any sense. So I, in my original work, I said, probably within the next 100,000 years, I said, being very generous, I think they could have done it in a couple of years, but being generous, we'll allow them a bit of time, but they should have reached Australia. Well, 900,000 years ago, we have this sudden population drop. Rather than being a cataclysmic ending of all 99% of our ancestors, that is the signature of a divergence event and a founder effect. In other words, a small splinter group becomes isolated. One of the perfect places to become isolated on our planet was Australia. So as they cross through down into Australia, they lose access to all of these other humans. So suddenly you get a drop down like that. There's no cataclysm. They don't need a cataclysm to explain this. So once they're there, they're also in a new environment, unique. So evolution will change them anyway, and they will also have problems. So the population stays quite small. We're going to see that. You can see it more visual because you get just how profound this drop is. From that to that, bang. We lose all those people. Oh, where did they go? And then it's like that. And it stays like that for about 100,000 years. So you've got a small group of people in a difficult environment, barely hanging on, nearly extinct. So it's considered, this is considered high extinction risk. So we almost, we almost went extinct. Also, in that period, you can see here on the right, there is understood to be a chromosomal fusion event. But two ancestral primate chromosomes become fused and they give us chromosome 2. And so that is occurring in this same time as this sudden event here and in this strange bottleneck. The other thing you notice here is after this very very steep sort of wine glass and here there's almost a bang, a population explosion it looks like, but it's not a population explosion. That is our ancestors leaving Oceania and returning to mainland Asia. They now have access to all of the other humans who are still alive, were still out there, and they are now breeding with them again. So we're up to 27,160 individuals at that point. That's still not back to the same levels as before. Two possibilities there. One, that a lot of these people did somehow die off from unknown events. Or, there's a new reproductive barrier. Chromosome 2 fusion. They've got a different number of chromosomes to all the other hominins. So although they can mate with each other, they will have a lot of problems. So they will not have children with every reproduction event, cutting down the number of people. So this is probably the population is still like that. But our ancestors are not successful in reproducing with a lot of these other people. They're too different now. We have this steady population size, this goes all the way down until the repopulating of Eurasia and the expansion of, of what become early modern humans, eventually onto fully modern humans down here. Now there's parts of that model that I disagree with profoundly, which is tackled into the Inter Africa books. You'll note this is an out of Africa event. I, I can test that completely, that this is a, an inter Africa event, that we have people that are in Oceania and that they are moving out at this point into Southeast Asia, East Asia, and eventually arrive in Europe, and then cross into Africa. There are people in Africa as well, but the ancestral groups, they're moving out of Australia. So it runs completely counter, and there's a lot of reasons why it runs counter, which I tackle in that, so I won't drag you into that, because that in itself is another multi-hour presentation. So as we tackled briefly, the origin of the human species, chromosome fusion, one of the profound changes that's considered to be foundational to modern humans is this chromosomal fusion event. And so we know it occurs before the split with Neanderthals and Denisovans. So in other words, it's happening in that same period as we saw in the earlier chart around 780,000 years ago where they're starting to diverge. There's the chromosome fusion event. It has to have occurred back then because Denisovans and Neanderthals also carry it and they split away from us after that. So in other words, it has to occur just before all of these strange new humans start appearing. Obviously, also isolates us reproductively from gorillas and bonobos and chimps to a greater degree than we already were. The other thing about the chromosome 2 fusion event, I should say as well, is that 
when they look at this, they say, well, normally a chromosome error is a problem, serious problem. And we can see that today. <clears throat> Mostly, if you have a chromosome error, you are either infertile or have other serious health issues. Uh, sometimes it's neutral and it won't cause a lot of noticeable problems, but it is it's not normally considered to be a benefit, put it that way. In this case, there's three things that really have to happen because we have a total replacement. We don't have somebody has this chromosome number and that then it fades away into a population which don't have this, which is what usually happens with anomalies. They are reabsorbed, right? That doesn't happen. There's a total replacement. All the humans on the planet end up with the new chromosome number. Well, that's weird. How does that happen? Well, it happens with three constraints. The chromosome fusion has to occur in a small, isolated population, as we already tackled. It seems like we had a small, isolated population. Therefore, it can become stable in that population. The second thing is it has to really occur in more than one person in a generation. So there's some interbreeding between people with that chromosome count. And the third one is it has to give extraordinary benefits, something that allows those people to outcompete other humans. So this is like an upgrade. And here you can see the rapidly expanding human brain. So at this point, brain is increasing with body size. Right? So it was, we understand what's going on there. Body size is getting bigger, your head's getting bigger, your brain gets bigger. But then, around this point here, something wackadoodle-doo happens. Because you can see here, look, it just goes off the charts. And so that is occurring. The first leap is with Homo erectus, which has a larger body. So that one, there's a change here, which is anomalous. But I'm not going to Homo erectus anomalies today, but there is the potential that Homo erectus was an engineered hominin as well. But right here, we have this sudden acceleration, which is no longer coupled to body size. It's just our head, is, you know, our skull is just expanding, our brain is expanding, and it goes off the charts. So they knew that something weird had happened around 800,000 years ago. We've known that from the fossil record for many decades. What we didn't know is why. But with genetic studies, we started to understand that that is coupled to a lot of weird changes that are going on. Not least chromosome 2, but not only. Again, in the last few months, another event, strength of my work, uh, is this, the discovery of a chance event around a million years ago that changed human brains forever. I contacted the team, I wanted to check about that date, because I'm picking me a, a vague date. I said, is, you know, you actually said it's a million years ago? And they said, no, no we're not. We just know that it happened before the split from Neanderthals and Denisovans, somewhere in that point. So the same point we've been dealing with chromosome 2. Again, I'd, I'd like to check these things. If you're going to do, you're going to propose something like this as real, you've got to be able to you know, stand there and debate with people that will make a fool of me if I get this wrong. So I wanted to make sure that I understood what they were saying and I wasn't wrong. So there is a chance rearrangement of the human genome. So not a million years ago. So at the beginning of that shift, which we talked about, closer to 800,000 years ago, probably kick-started the evolution of modern humans from our primate ancestors. A recent study explains why human DNA contains sections, many of which are involved in brain development, that are unique to us and are not shared even with our closest relatives, chimpanzees. Their research so far does show just how unique and unlikely the evolution of the human brain really is. So in other words, this is an event that happens overnight. This is not slow accumulation of mutations. What they have found is there was a singular event. They think in either a single sperm or a single egg or a single fetus, that there is a massive rearrangement of the human genome. And it, it changes it in ways where parts that are now touching, which activate segments, which change our brain, particularly change our brain. There's nothing else like it. They compared this, it came out of a study called the Zoonomia Project, which was contrasting a range of mammals, hundreds of mammals. We are unique. This does not occur in any other mammal species. So there's a range of other changes in there, hundreds, that are unique to us, called human accelerated regions. And these are in what's called non-coding DNA regions. And in fact, um, pro profoundly conserved regions. So if you think of the genome, we have genes, which most people know about genes. We also have what used to be called junk DNA. That's now called highly, cons well, that's sort of non-coding DNA. And in non-coding DNA, we have highly conserved regions which are strips of code which haven't changed in millions of years, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years, and are identical or near to identical across all mammals. So they are doing something profoundly important. When they change, mostly the organisms die. So the best example is HAR1, which I think is on this one. HAR1, the first one they discovered a few years back, they contrasted this is a uh, 100, sorry, this is a yeah, 112, no, 118 letter long sequence 
and they did a, they ran the test on this so they said that, that this basically should be identical in in our species chimps particularly so they ran it against chimpanzees and chickens chickens have been distinct from us for 300 million years chimps only for about seven so when they contrasted these species what they found is that between the chimp and the chicken hr1 had three successful mutations sorry no two successful mutations so one successful change for every 150 million years of evolution that's pretty darned um, fixed so we know the kind of the rate it should change at when they contrasted the same segment between chimps and humans where there should be no change, seven million years, that's nothing in that scale, they found that 18 letters had changed. And so they say the fact that HR1 was essentially frozen in time through hundreds of millions of years indicates that it does something very important. That it then underwent abrupt revision in humans suggests that this function was significantly modified in our lineage. Statistically speaking, the probability that a highly conserved DNA sequence will change multiple times over six million years of evolution is close to zero. That's Catherine Pollard, PhD biostatistician at the Gladstone Institute, one of the main scholars of this field. So, what else is going on? I'd love to say that was the end of it, but it's not. Turns out there's some other really weird stuff going on here. Study finds missing genetic information in the human genome that contributed to evolutionary advancements. Now this is really running counter to expectations again. The, and they point here. So these are large segments of code, mainly from the highly conserved regions. Again, these super stable regions. Large segments of code that have just deleted, they've vanished. And they must have been doing something critically important because they're stable in all the other mammals. The deletions are strange because they affect large segments. Some of us are missing large chunks of our genome. These deletions should have negative effects and as a result be eliminated from the population by natural selection. But they're not. They're all there. And what they do, in fact, they found that many of them are contributing to the brain changes. They're giving us a superior cognitive abilities associated with like, the neocortex developing, like profound differences to us and all the other mammals, linked to Mysterious deletions, mysterious accelerations, refolding of the genome, a chromosome fusion, all of these things that shouldn't be there. So these are called human conserved deletions or H. condels. And the previous things we tackled were the human accelerated region or HARS. So if you want to look those up, look for HARS and H. condels, and obviously for the 3D genome folding, which we tackled as well, and chromosome 2 fusion. All of those you can look up yourself, check what I'm saying. All of them are unexpected and all of them are profound. Now the other thing is, that evolution is random, isn't it? That's what they tell us, random. What they found with these HARs is that over 50%, the ones that are identified, are associated with the brain. Doesn't sound so random, does it? Right, the science of evolution of the faulty bodies explained from incompetent sperm to bad metabolism. So you hear a lot, probably if you're familiar with these kind of topics, with the ancient aliens, you hear about upgrades, you hear about it in the New Age community, you hear about it in the aliens, upgrades, 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 we've got these upgrades, but it's not all good news. Because we have a lot of weird problems, humans. You might know, so a lot of people have genetic issues, have these genetic diseases, other issues. One of the most profound issues is in our reproductive systems. And I probably don't even lay out, but for a lot of women, and probably the, I would say, from my standard statistics, the vast majority of women will experience reproductive problems, often horrible reproductive problems, particularly losses of fetuses or losses of children during, during pregnancy. Right? Why is that? You look at the other primates, you look at them, they're not really having that problem. Not only that, they have very easy childbirths. They have uh, visible uh, ovulation cycles. They have all these things that are really helpful. You'd think evolution would favor that in us. Why did we lose all that stuff? Why did we lose that? Isn't the purpose of an organism to reproduce? Isn't that the most important thing an organism can do is reproduce? So why would evolution kick us in the nuts like that and say, no, not you lot. The others can have that. You're gonna have a bloody nightmare with it. Right, because that's what happens. And we end up with all these severe problems and no one quite understand why. So they say, well, look, if this is, you know, some sort of anomaly in the body, evolution should clear it out because those that can reproduce effectively will out-reproduce those that can't and the problem fixes itself. But it doesn't. Why not? The reason is because it turns out these same segments that are causing these problems are linked to the change segments that give us the brain and give us the thumbs, give us the anatomy, give us all this stuff. We can't get rid of it. If, we get, if the evolution tries to sweep it away, it sweeps away everything that's made us successful. So this is the, the, 
the ironic kind of catch-22 of the genetic engineering that I say occurred is that, remember what we said earlier? We did it with the medical kits from the crafts. That's all we had, just the, the, basically the medical kits on the crash saucer. We didn't have the right kit to do it properly. So what they ended up with is a bodge job. So yes, we get the bigger brains, but we get a whole heap of genetic problems that most organisms don't have. Now we live in an era where, of course, some of this can be addressed using similar technologies, and we can see that is happening. You know, title there, Genetically Modified Humans, the X-Men of Scientific Research. But they're now looking at changing us, you know, and all the rest of it. Not necessarily all for the good, but one area that is good is looking at ways to fix these genetic diseases. And that is happening. We obviously had CRISPR as one of the technologies, but that's being superseded. There's now a couple of new technologies that are safer and more precise. And my hope is certainly that we can utilize the same kind of technologies that left us with these problems to fix those problems. And that, I think, is in the coming years we're going to start seeing that happen, which I, I do support. I don't support us being made into freaks by some scientists that would like to do that. But certainly fixing genetic issues. And because we are not going to see this fixed by natural means. Because the same way it was done is the only way we're going to fix this. That's cool, near the end. The other thing that's happening as well, some of you might be familiar with this, is the space, uh, kind of, you know, space scientists are looking at bioengineering our astronauts, modifying the astronauts for space travel. <laughs> and one of the things they're looking at is combining us with these, the tardigrades. Now, why do they don't do that? Because they can confer to us radiation proofing abilities, amongst other things. Obviously, they're a very hardy animal. Most people know about this. Tartary is possibly living on the moon now from the Israeli crash that dumped a whole load of them onto the moon. We don't know. Maybe they're alive. These things are almost unkillable. So we are looking at doing the very thing that we started off talking about. So if advanced beings are traveling the cosmos and they are landing on planets and they have to live on them, they modify themselves. Now look at us. Thus we have become like the gods. We are starting to do the same kinds of things, but not at their level. We have to be very careful. Because you can end up making us, obviously, into freaks. I don't know if anyone remembers the quote from Elon Musk. Because with the right RNA code, you can turn someone into a freaking butterfly. But that, that's the reality. So we have to be careful. But there is the potential there to utilize the same technologies that were used to create us to fix some of these problems. Now, going forward with my work, obviously, I'm the director of the Alien Technosignatures Research Group. We sort of touched on that earlier. And we are looking to bring to this topic uh, a team of open-minded scientists, already we've got about six people on board, geologists, genetics, um, some social science people as well, because I think the philosophical and cultural aspects of this are important. And if this becomes, in any sense, mainstream, I think the impact will be profound, much more than saying that UFOs are real, or that even the aliens live on Mars. That if it turns out, you know, if we can put out there, in peer review and all the rest of it, if we can put it out there that we ourselves have been modified by an intelligence. This has profound ramifications, of course. So we are, we are aware of that, and we're working with also with social scientists who can help revise us and philosophers. But the most important part, of course, is to give the evidence out there, because I don't know about you, but I am sick of stories that didn't have support. You can, the aliens community is full of them. The UFO community is full of them. You know, paranormal, all of these communities are full of them. Spirituality, look around. I was tired of that, and that's why I've dedicated myself to this. It's the only case I've encountered where I can support with solid evidence, and I can go up against scientists and say, well, what about all of this data? So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you enjoy it. I know it's a whiff stop end there with a lot of information, but don't make you late. So, but any of that as well, you can obviously you know, reach out to me. I'm on Twitter a lot, sometimes probably too much, and probably arguing with too many people. But if, if you want, you can reach out to me, and I can probably clarify some of that information that we've tackled very quickly. But hopefully that, uh, hopefully that was interesting. I'm not saying go in away and agree with me or believe it. Check it for yourselves. I do not advocate the idea of just believing stories. I believe that you have to have support for stories and then people can believe you. If they've had their own experiences, of course, I understand why some people will say, well, I agree with you, I believe you because I've had something happen that makes me believe you. That I understand. But no one should take any of this as some sort of new religion, which I think is a bit of a problem with a lot of the field, is that it's all too often it's the Corey goods of this world and they've got all these fancy stories and people give them money and follow them around. And I don't want any of that. I think we have to get to a point where this is a serious topic. You know, if this has really happened, it's profound. If it hasn't, well, I'll be debunked at some point and then I'll find something else to do. But, so I hope you enjoyed that all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you.